Hey everybody, Dr. Rob here. Excited to be here. We've got a great uh, amount of information, stuff that's really interesting for you out there that you really want to uh, listen to. We're gonna have an update, an extensive update on the antibody tests. As we all know, it's not only in the news, it's in the news all day long. So you had heard last week that I had given my um, tests. Now with uh, my colleagues and myself, we're getting patient results in and it's very interesting what we're seeing. So I would love you all to do me a favor and share this with everybody. So reach out, press the share button, uh, feel free to do that, make a comment, love to ask you, answer a question that you may ask. So feel free to ask a question and give me a shout out, let me know where you are. I know we're all, or at least most of us are at home and those at work, you know, have um, some time uh, possibly now to uh, ask a question. So um, having said that, um, I, was waiting, I was waiting for my laptop, so we'll, we'll just go forward without it. Um, the antibody tests, the results are in. It's interesting. So let me go over what antibodies are. Antibodies are your ability to ward off, ward off pathogens. Viruses are considered a pathogen. So we have two forms of immune systems. So we have our overall immune system, and then within that we have an innate and an adaptive and acquired immune system. Our innate is something that we had day one, you know, God gave us. The acquired and the adaptive is something that we acquired and adapted to about 10,000 years ago. So within that, our two immune systems are used Interestingly, sometimes synergistically, hopefully, to ward off specific um, attacks from pathogens. Viruses are a pathogen. Now, having covered that, um, there are three types of immunoglobins, IgA, IgM, and IgG. So, hey, Veronica, how are you? Wow, Nora, hello. It looks like it's working. It looks like I've got my stuff to work, so I'm going to hit a little like. And the only problem is I don't know how to get this to move down. So we're just going to keep going. So IgA, we're not testing for IgG, IgA in the antibody test because IgA is in the middle. So IgM, M, remember morning, early. It comes out early in the infection. IgA comes out more in the middle and IgG overlaps IgM. Here's IgA and it comes over and it's the long standing. IgG is what we really want. IgG is the big guy. IgG is the guy that we want to talk about because what IgG is, it's 75% of our immunoglobin. It's the largest one and it's one that passes the placenta and possibly can protect the mother and the fetus, which we've got actually a study to share with you on that after we're going over the um, immunoglobins. Initially, we've got something called secretory IgA, which is released in um, mucous membranes. And within the secretory, we have our natural killer cells. But we want to really hone in on IgM and IgG. So when IgG comes out at the beginning, it's sort of the pawn in the game. It sort of holds it off. IgG comes in and it's much more powerful. We're looking for positive I, if we got it, we're looking for a positive IgG. IgG is so strong against these virulent viruses, it's actually able to cover what we call the ACE2 receptor sites. That was my understanding. So in that it's covering the ACE2 receptor sites, it really allows to decrease that viral replication. It's our body's own soldiers coming out. So there are serum tests, there are wound tests. We had someone trying to call in. Any, anybody of note? No worries. So we had serum tests and in those serum tests, we're going to test for IgM and IgG. Now, let's go through four scenarios, and then we're gonna add in what my patients had, which is great in case scenario. Um, I use M for Marines, first to fight. Love it. So Mike Powell came in and said, I use M for Marines, first to fight. And guys, I can actually see your comments now. So, correct, first to fight, and G. We gotta figure out what G is, just ongoing, grunts, just never give up. Um, so. There are four scenarios. Scenario number one is positive IgM, negative IgG. It means that you're at the beginning of the infection. You got it, so you may want to take uh, the, the PCR test, the nasal swab, and everything like that. Clearly stay away from everybody else and quarantine yourself. You can also have IgM and IgG, which is the case that I want to talk about in a moment, 
fascinating outcomes with patients that have that. IgM and IgG means that you're moving through the infection, but you're not done with the infection. And again, there's some caveats. The one that uh, many of my patients who thought they had it five, six, seven weeks ago where they felt really bad. And interesting, I want to let you know that I ask all my patients before they order the test, do you think you had the flu in the last three months? And so far, everybody who said, I had a flu, it was the worst flu I have ever had, they came back positive in some way, shape, or form. And those who said, no, you know, I was a little tired, you know, like right now I suffer from my allergies, hasn't been. So really getting excited about the results and the docs I'm talking to also who jumped on early, the early adapters really felt the same way. So IgM, I, IgG, both positive, not done going through the process. Now, negative IgM and positive IgG means that you're done and you got your own immunity to it. We don't know how long, we don't know if it's permanent, but you have some immunity to it. Myself, I was IgM and IgG negative, which means I may have been exposed. However, I am not having any immunity to it. So let's go through some of the scenarios. I had one scenario where a wife had it and um, she is now IgM negative and IgG positive. And she said it was the worst flu. Comorbidity, uh, mid forties, a little elevated hypertension. It was pretty bad. You know, she never had to go to the hospital. She just said it was like the worst flu that she ever had. She doesn't recall ever being as sick as she was. Again, no respiratory issues, things like that. Somewhat of a cough, fatigue, on and off, fever. Um, her husband, who's in close confines with her um, in for the three, three and a half weeks that she was sick, negative and negative, which when I tell everybody, they're like, wow. But that's how it is. It's inexplicable. We don't know. We're learning every day about this virulent virus. So these tests are critical because you're learning about yourself and you're adding to the data points that are needed to help the scientists, help the doctors figure out the most efficacious way to help the population. Um, so we covered that. So I've had a couple of, a couple, a husband and a wife also, and this is not, I'm not the only one that had this. Several doctors have said that where they're both IgM and IgG positive, yet they said they haven't had symptoms for three or four weeks, which is very perplexing. It's a unique scenario. As I said, it's a virulent novel virus. So in this scenario, um, having spoken to several docs on that, what's been theorized is in 2003, we go back to the original SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV, the uh, CDC hasn't changed that they think that it will take 28 days from the absence of fever to get full-fledged IgG. Now that may change, but we don't have enough data points. That's why these tests are so important. We're paying for our own data points. We're doing to see where we are. So it's interesting that they both still are positive yet haven't had symptoms. Now they both have IgM. It's conceivable that they reinfected themselves because they're in close quarters. So that's the kind of idea. That's why when you take the test, you got to talk to your healthcare practitioner. It's not as simple as negative and positive. There is a um, theory to it. There is a clinical thought process to it. It's very thought provoking. And now as this comes in, there's different supplementations that we would recommend. So some of the people who didn't take the supplements, I'm not saying they got it because they didn't take the supplements, are now considering taking some of the great supplements, vitamin C, vitamin D, L-glutathione, and the such. And there's more. Some now are saying, you know what? I want to take it because they want to boost the immune system. They were happy. Now, to get back and segue back to the IgM and IgG, it could be that their immune system is slower. They have a little, they're a little older than I am. It could be that it's slower and it's taking longer for the switch or the convalescent IgG to come. So again, if you're interested in the test, let me know. If you're interested in a conversation about antibodies or why the test is so good, there were some arguments that the test isn't as good. There's a lot of people out there. Um, so you really want to look at proven N. N is the sample size. You ask the company that you go with what the sample size is. Our sample size is 2 million. In addition to that, you also want to ask what's your um, false negative rate and what's your false positive rate, sensitivity and specificity. So you want your false negative rate to be really high. 
So this one is almost 100% because you don't want to get a false negative. You don't want to be, say you're negative and walk outside and be positive because if that happens, of course, you're obviously probably going to spread it. However, a false positive isn't quite as bad because most of us are convalescing. The false positive uh, rate, meaning only one out of 10 people get a false positive and they're getting better. At the bottom, the denominator, the false negatives, almost 100% and it's excellent. So if you have any questions on that, uh, let me know. I see Dave, my man Dave D'Angelo just joined. Hey Dave, how are you? I appreciate you joining in. Hendrick, how you doing? Great to see you. Um, I'm going to go back up before I go a little further. Let me see who else. Just give some shout outs. Okay. We got some shout outs to Nora, Veronica, um, punched in. Mike's always chit chatting with me. I appreciate it. And okay. So let me know where you are. I can see it. I've got my um, computer working right now. And um, I'd, lo I'd love to scream out and say hi. While we have a, a mini second before I move on, let's talk about who helps us, who sponsors with us, who has joined with us to share this message. Well, we've had a few different people, uh, Creator Chiropractic in Bedford, Oregon, Eight Weeks to Wellness via Dane Donahue um, in Pennsylvania, and across the pond, Veronica Hope in the UK. They do a great job. They're always willing to help. They've been ahead of the curve because they're lifestyle advocates. Hey, Hendrick, I'm doing great. It's great to hear from you. Life is good. I hope it's well for you. Um, you know, give me a text. Let me know how things are going. I, from, yeah, that's right. Veronica Hope from the UK. I know it, even though, um, right, you're, you're uh, Australian. Thanks, Mike. It is always a pleasure for me also. Um, so a couple of factoids I always like to share. 15% of pregnant women were positive for coronavirus in New York City. The majority of the patients who tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 in delivery were asymptomatic. Virtually, I think it was 15% had it and made, were positive. And out of that 100, you know, 15%, it was like 1.9 had symptoms. So it's really interesting that the pregnant women did not have the symptoms. Yet 15% is, you know, between about 1.65. Uh, that, that's a pretty substantial amount. Some other factoids are that viral loads, we just found out, of asymptomatic and symptomatic patients are similar, which means that they're equally effective in spreading COVID-19. So if subject A is really symptomatic, they can sh share it. If subject B is asymptomatic, they can share it equally. So the viral load doesn't matter, it's just as equally as contagious. So, hey Rita, I know you're the OBGYN. Um, you have a patient currently, she's postpartum. Okay, I'm assuming she's postpartum positive or are you just telling me she's postpartum? Fill that in and let me know, we'll get to that. Lo love to have that conversation with you. Um, this was inf infectious disease. This is going to blow your mind about viral shedding. It was unbelievable when I read these articles. So infectious disease, April 10th, 2020 online. Um, there were 24 COVID uh, patients that were discharged. They had two consecutive throat swabs and one rectal that they were negative on. Having said that, the median viral shredding in that study, meaning after they were negative, they were still passing it through their poop was 12 days median. That means half were before 12 and half were after, not the average. The shortest was four days. The longest was 34 days. Another study, this is all from China, they had a median shedding of 20 days and the longest was 37. So remember we talked about that patient that was IgM or patients positive and IgG positive? Well, it's very interesting how the gut keeps it there and how it resonates in the gut. So clearly after the antibody test, possibly next week, we may start talking about some gut tests to test for this viral overload. What a great segue into that. Another study that came out interesting, it's a non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. You really don't want it. Most of these patients had, um, were obese and obesity and, and too much sugar, too much fructose leads you down a path of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. You really just don't want it. 202 patients were tested with COVID-19. They were positive. 
at 50% of them at admission actually had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which shows that they either had a blood sugar issue, obesity, or both. That poses an issue. Now, during the hospitalization, that 50% went up to 75.2%. So one quarter of the people that had that were in had a liver problem. So half of the people ex that were taken in actually had a liver problem before they came in, and yet another quarter had the liver problem after they were brought in. So what is that saying? Well, as we said multiple times, the lung and the ACE2 receptors are also on the liver, the kidney, and the gut. This is not a one area disease. This area is unique because of the spike protein that actually adheres to the ACE2 receptors that opens up what we call a furine cleavage, which is an enzyme inside the cell, which allows it to replicate quickly and kind of like sticks tighter. The spike protein is 10 times tighter. They call it a sneaky, they call it a sticky. They've called it multiple virulent type of virus. It does that, gets in the cell, and his biggest problem is it can get into multiple cells and multiple tissues at the same time. And yes, it can, now we're considering, Mike is right, possibly the heart. And if not, the lack of breathing strains the heart. So this is, um, this is a virus, this is a pathogen that causes stress on your body. So um, I just want to reiterate that the ACE2 inhibitors are in the small intestine and liver, like I said before. Check this out, if you will. The, largest, the liver has the largest amount of macrophages in the body. So it has the largest amount of macrophages in that that's the initial thing, your innate immune system. So you, that can really lead you that innate going into the acquired can elevate your ability to have that cytokine storm. Obesity was clearly implicated in these patients and there was a direct correlation to the gut to liver axis. So when you have a leaky gut, pathogens pass your gut and get into your bloodstream. 75% of the toxins that float in your gut get through your gut to your liver via the bloodstream. 25% of the toxins go from your gut to the liver. So there's a direct axis between gut and liver and liver and gut. So clearly, we've expanded not just immune boosting, immune boosting via the gut, some gut testing may be needed, and liver, as we'll talk about some detox because we're going to have some time. And in functional medicine, functional nutrition, the age-old question is, do I do the detox first or do I fix the gut first? Or do I fix the gut first and do detox next? In my Super 7 Action Plan, which I will share with you, I will share with you in an upcoming Facebook Live, I do them together. It's a very unique, exciting, effective way of really fixing the body from the inside out because we're always looking at systems, not symptoms, to get to what we call root cause resolution. And part of the root cause resolution may be also fixing your systems, getting yourself good gut health, and clearly taking care of your liver and your liver through lifestyle. Nobody does it better than Dana Veronica, lifestyle. Here's your opportunity to get into shape. Hey, Mitch, great to see that you joined. Hey, Dr. Fadi, my man, great to see you. I'm happy you guys could make it. I know everybody's really busy. So once again, that, all that dissertation was on the Journal of Hepatology, March 27th. I can't even read my own handwriting now without my specs. March 27th, 2020. Now I want to get to one more thing on viral shedding in children. Here we had the clearance in children of SARS-CoV-2 in the respiratory tract occurred within two weeks after the abatement of fever. So they were negative after the, they lost their fever in two weeks by the swab. The children had RNA detectable in the stools for four weeks. So the math says two weeks after, theoretically, they tested negative, the children had the virus passing for two weeks in their stool. The bathroom may be one of the major means not discussed of transmission. Hey, Mitch. So I want to read the conclusion to this article. This article was in Science uh, Direct, um, and here it is. Persistent shedding of SARS-CoV-2 in stools of infected children raises the possibility that the virus may be transmitted through contaminates, contaminated fomites. So interesting, the G, it lasts two weeks longer in the GI tract and can still be transmitted. So you're testing negative, you're thinking you're good. It may be that they need to make some addendums 
and addendums to the idea of two weeks or longer. So um, I wanted to cover all that. Thanks, Mike, for the Super 7. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody understood that. Give me a shout out. Ask a question. I want to synthesize just what I want. I give you a lot of information at a rapid fire today. So here's what I just want to review. Um, number one, antibodies. Everybody should consider an antibody test. IgM and IgG. IgM is at the earliest. IgG is later. You want that super IgM. Um, hey, Hector, how are you? Any other thoughts on the virus during pregnancy? I've read that women who are in the third trimester have higher levels of melatonin. You know, that's a great question. I don't know that anybody knows the answer now. I mean, melatonin, as we know, is one of the best things to take to decrease the cytokine storm. It's interesting that if 15% of the women were positive for um, uh, COVID-19 and only about 2% um, were symptomatic, it's clear that either that's the number or that was a number in pregnant women, so we don't know. You know, discussing with a couple of the scientists this morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, what's really interesting is, well, again, we're trying to gather data points. So we're going with what we know. The best thing is, obviously, the physical, social distancing, if you will. Uh, take care of your body, health, exercise, change your lifestyle so you come out of this strong, eat well, take the supplements that we keep recommending. Um, and you know what? I wouldn't use a public bathroom if I went out. I kind of like would wait. Because as Mike asked about the oral fecal route uh, prevention, um, it's very clear that people use the lavatory. Um, there could be some fecal matter. You can touch yourself. And then, you know, remember, you have to invite the virus into your home. Even though it's on your hands, it doesn't mean it gets in. It doesn't get through your hands. You've got to touch your mouth. You've got to touch your nose. You've got to touch your eyes. You've got to touch your face. It's got to get in there. So that's what we talk about with the fecal oral uh, transmission. So again, if anybody has any questions, antibody test. We talked about the pregnancy. Really interesting in that we also talked about a couple of other factoids, but the big thing that resonates in, it's in the gut. What have you done for your guts lately? Do you have the guts to be healthy? You've got to keep your gut healthy. And great ways of keeping your gut healthy is, ah, the best ways to keep your gut healthy may be eating healthy, exercise, no gluten, no processed food, no sugar, no dairy, no nicotine, no artificial sweeteners. Air hand dryers are a no bueno. Because the air hair dryers, they found out that there was almost on every hair dryer fecal matter at the bottom on the inside of the dryer. So when you blow it down, the fecal matter comes to your hands. So it sprays out. You're better off with the, uh, the, the towel or the, or the paper. The paper is much better than the, ha the air hand dryers, without question. And then, of course, we, hey, Hector. Agreed on a public bathroom. We don't allow patients to use the bathroom in our office anymore due to potential, the potential of fecal oral. Yeah, tell them to use not an office. So, you know, we're chiropractors. We're still allowed in most states to see patients. Some are in an emergency status and everything like that. So, you know, the chiros are doing a great job of taking care, wearing a mask, gloves, gowns, and everything, one patient at a time. Um, we're doing a lot of telehealth here, so you know. We're, on, we're messaging every day. We're trying to deal and talk and help patients through their issues, you know, through the telehealth, through the telemedicine. Um, oh, boy, gross, right? Yeah. Um, it, it is what it is. But it's re I wanted to resonate with you before we close up shop, before anybody else has a last uh, question before we leave, that it's prevalent, the virus, in the gut. It's your takeaway for approximately two weeks after you're testing negative to the PCR test. It'll really be interesting when they can start doing the test, and here's something for you, when they start matching the stool and the antibodies. So, guys, it's been my pleasure. I hope I shared some good information with you. It's been exciting over the last about three, three and a half weeks, getting on every day. We're here, Eastern Standard Time, 1 o'clock. We go from about 1 to 1.30. Feel free to give any shout-outs. Please share this with your friends. I'm here for you if you need a Saturday. Um, Hector, how are you? I was wondering if keeping a healthy gut can result in reduced time that the virus lasts in the body, less virus shedding in the stool. Well, we don't have a study on that, but I would say that's a great option. Wouldn't you think the stronger the gut is, 
the, the quicker that you would shed. So, and I think there's going to be studies without question. I think there's going to be studies on this. I'm talking to some different companies. They've got some stool tests and they're trying to match and everything. So I think the ultimate kit may be that anybody with the stool test at some point, we'll see how it is. You know, you got to poop, to, you got to scoop to poop or poop to scoop or something like that. I appreciate all the uh, positive uh, feedback from you guys. We'll do it every day. So you guys have a good, good time. Good day. Have a great lunch. Dr. Rob, always yours in health.